So we have two more animal phyla left in our cladogram here. So we've traveled through talking about the parazoa, the new metazoa with true tissues, radial symmetry, bilateral symmetrical organisms, protostomes with determinant cleavage, and now we arrive at deuterostomes, which includes phylum echinodermata and phylum chordata. So deuterostomes are defined by this type of embryonic um, development that shows indeterminate cleavage. Remember that means that the embryo does not have the cell fates determined until later in development, and so that allows for identical twins like we see here. An additional trait that arises with the deuterostomes is an endoskeleton. This endoskeleton can be made of different things. In us, it's obviously bone, it can be cartilage, or something um, totally different in the echinoderms. So phylum echinodermata includes sea stars, sea cucumbers, brittle stars, and sea urchins. So here's kind of the classic sea star. This is a um, sea cucumber, um, and uh, both sea star, sea cucumbers, as well as sea urchins and brittle stars all show pentaradial symmetry. That means radial symmetry on an axis of five. So Think of this as a circle, that's the radial part, but here's the five parts, to, um, the five separate um, edges to it. A sea cucumber is like a sea star folded up on itself. And in fact, um, if you look closely at a sea cucumber, you can see these lines. And we don't see all of them because we're only seeing half of the sea cucumber, but you would see five of those lines. And if you looked in its mouth parts, you would see five lines in its mouth part as well. And same thing is true for a sea urchin or a sand dollar as an example. If you've ever seen a sand dollar, I'm holding up a sand dollar here to the camera. Um, this, is the remain, this is the remains of a sand dollar, so it's dead, but you can see the five parts to it. Um, I can't quite get the angle right. There we go. Um, the five parts to it on the, the remains of the sand dollar. Um, so again, you see this, this pentaradial symmetry. Um, so because it shows radial symmetry, that means that cephalization is absent. So there's no cephalization. That means there's no head. There's no sensory structures concentrated at the head. So they have a sense of touch, but they don't have vision or anything like that. Um, and they have a, a simplified nervous system, again, and um, not a complex nervous system concentrated at the head. And so this is kind of weird because these are technically part of bilateria. Okay, so they are part of the group that we call bilateria, even though they have radial symmetry. Um, and so this is due to evolution um, and evolutionary relationships. So echinoderms have a bilateral ancestor. So their ancestor was bilateral. That bilateral ancestor evolved to the pentaradial echinoderm. Whereas our radiata organisms, so like the cnidarians, they go from a sponge asymmetrical ancestor to radial. So no symmetry to radial symmetry. So this is the evolutionary pathway of cnidarians and other members of radiata. This is the evolutionary history of echinoderms. They have a bilateral ancestor that back evolves. That's what it's sometimes called, back evolves, like going back to a trait that organisms more ancient than it had. Um, so it goes back to, back evolves to radial symmetry. So um, part of the evidence for this is that the larva of echinoderms are actually bilateral. So as is often the case, embryonic states recapitulate evolutionary history. So for example, human embryos have tails the tails go away um, before we're born normally, but it's showing that we evolved from an organism that had a tail in the same way that the larva of echinoderms is bilateral and the adult has pentaradial symmetry, supports that there was a bilateral ancestor. 
So this is an, uh, an example of convergent evolution. So again, a sponge took one pathway to radial symmetry, a, and a kinoderm has a different evolutionary history for the same trait of radial symmetry. So remember, that's what convergent evolution means. It means then we have a, the same trait, but it evolved in two separate evolutionary pathways, two separate evolutionary events, rather than being shared from an ancestor. So this is a closer look at the sea star body plan. So again, remember, there's no brain because there's no cephalization. There's So instead, there's a very simple nervous system with no sensory structures. Um, there's an endoskeleton made up of these hard platelets. And so when you see a dried sea star, that like you'll see in class, um, that's the endoskeleton. There was a coating of soft tissue, a thin skin that went over the top of that structure. Or like with my um, uh, sand dollar that I was showing you, this was the inside. There was a coating of soft tissue that went around the, out, the outside of this. So they have a water vascular system um, for movement. So what happens is they pull water in through this pore called the madreporite, and then it gets um, spread. The water gets moved throughout this um, water vascular system, and then on that water attached to that water vac vascular system are tube feet that swell with water, and then. The tube feet are what the um, sea star can control as far as their angles. So they will move the tube feet in different directions. So the tube feet kind of move like this. Whoops, there's the camera. The tube feet move like this, but they swell with water to get movement. And it's the water vascular system that swells those tube feet. Um, and so please watch this video for a really nice demonstration of how that water vascular system um, moves the tube feet. Um, they have a, 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 com a complex digestive system, so a mouth, um, and they are out of that mouth. So the mouth is on the bottom side. So this, this is the top of the sea star. And if we go back to this picture, actually, this is where the mouth is. Um, they can get onto a food source and actually move their stomach into their food source. So for example, sea stars can eat mussels and they will actually pry open the shell of the mussel and put their stomach into, release their stomach into the mussel shell and their stomach will give off the enzymes, digest the mussel and absorb the, um, the, the dissolved mussel all while the stomach is of the sea star is inside of the mussel shell. So it's pretty in, unusual um, way to feed. And again, I'd encourage you to check out this um, video to see that in action. Okay, oh. um, so, so that's all I'm gonna say about the echinoderms. Um, and so now we'll take a look at the phylum chordata. So phylum chordata is our last animal phylum. Um, the majority of the members of chordata are vertebrates, which we will talk about um, later. Um, but there are a couple of invertebrates, so mostly vertebrates, two invertebrates that we'll talk about now. Um, the members of phylum chordata all have four distinct innovations that occur at some point in the life cycle. So for most of the members of phylum chordata, these traits may only be in the um, larval or um, embryonic stages. Um, so there's a notochord, which is a single flexible rod um, that will give rise in vertebrates to the vertebral column. There's the dorsal hollow nerve cord, which um, is part of the primitive, which is the origins of the nervous system, I should say. Um, pharyngeal slits, which we see here. Um, they're also sometimes called gill slits. Um, they will give rise to different structures and different organisms. And then this fourth one here is a post-anal tail. And so notice the anus is here, and there is an extension um, beyond that. That's the post-anal tail. Post-anal means after the anus, okay? And this is different from, like, say, a worm. 
So a worm has a mouth and an anus. So a worm has a mouth over here and its anus is all the way out the other end. So all the way at that back. So that's why it does not have a postanal tail. Basically the last part of it is the anus, but in chordates, the, there's, the body continues past the anus. So again, a postanal tail. So you're probably thinking, well, I'm a chordate and I don't have a postanal tail. How am I part of this? Well, again, remember that at some point in the life cycle, um, chordates have this trait. So humans and other um, closely related primates do not have a tail in their adult stages, but the embryo does. All right, so again, we're focusing here just on the two invertebrates that belong to phylum chordata. So we'll look first at the lancelets. Um, a very small group, just 26 known species. They're all ocean dwelling filter feeders. So they filter food from the water. So here's a lancelet um, diagram. So it sticks, it kind of keeps its body protected by, by keeping it embedded in the, the bottom of the ocean or the bottom of the, the seabed. Um, and then it has tentacles that just kind of hang out and filter food to its mouth. So they're usually sessile. So again, they are hanging out in one location, um, burrowing into the, the, the um, bottom of the ocean, but they can't actually come out and swim if they want to. Um, so that's the lancelets. Um, and notice that the lancelet adult body actually has all of the chordate traits. So it has a notochord, the dorsal hollow nerve cord, the pharyngeal slits, and the postanal tail. So again, it's displaying all of the chordate traits in the adult stage. Tunicates or urochordata is the other member of um, a chordata that's related to, or sorry, that's an invertebrate. Um, and so they get their name tunicate because their whole body is covered in what's called a tunic. It's like this layer of sort of skin that just sort of surrounds the whole body. Um, the adult form is sessile, so it's embedded in one place, it's not moving, and it only displays the pharyngeal slits. So that's the only one of the four chordate traits that it still has an adult, as an adult, but the larva has all four of the chordata hallmarks. The really interesting thing about um, the tunicates is that they are the closest living relatives of vertebrates. So tunicates are close relatives of the vertebrates. The lancelets are more closely related to the echinodermata. And I don't know why, but this really surprises me. Um, and that's why I always mention it because these guys are so weird looking. Um, they remind many people at, at a surface level of sponges um, even though they have organs and everything, so they're they're not sponges, just to be really clear. But like, if you were to come across it and you didn't know that much and you didn't dissect it or anything, it might almost look like a sponge. Um, but it's actually more closely related to us. Um, they're filter feeders as well, um, and they kind of like sponges. They create a suction through their bodies to to help filter out food. Um, so again, another way to why why they look like sponges is because they feed really similarly. But again, remember, they tunicates are actually our closest relatives and closest relative of other vertebrates. The lancets are more closely related to sea stars. So that's the invertebrate members of phylum chordata. But remember, the vertebrates are a huge group in phylum chordata, and that's the focus of the next set of lectures.